Good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me? That's right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you all again for attending. Uh, we're excited about our day today. If you haven't met me, I'm John Kramer. I'm filling in for Lori Glaude. I'm Vice President of Ann. Um, if you have not registered and you came in last night, please catch up with Mike Arm. Mike Arm is your treasurer. He waved his arm right here. Uh, he will take care of you. Thank you, Mike. Um, in my presentation last night, I said we had people from far, as far away as California, which is really nice, but you guys have lost it. My son from Saudi Arabia is attending today now. Uh, we are excited about our day. We have a great lineup ahead of us. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items. Babysitting um, open this morning at 8. Um, Please pick up your, your kids um, for lunch. We have to give uh, Becky a full break there for an hour. Uh, we also want to thank, take a moment to thank our sponsors, uh, um, Accutech, Gauden Sons, and Archer and Griner. Our first session this morning is with Dr. Hurdle, as you all know, that's why you're all here. Uh, we'd, we'd uh, like to thank Delta Gamma, who awarded Anne a $2,600 grant to allow us to record today's sessions, including Dr. Hurdle's session. So we'll have videos in each room, um, it'd be great. We're going to put that in the member-only section of our website in the future. Um, a special thanks to Kelly Smith for a member of the grant. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, my colleague, Mike Arm, who has known Dr. Hurdle for 12 years. Uh, so it seems only appropriate to have Mike come up and introduce uh, Dr. Hurdle. Good morning, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Um, many of you uh, do not need to be introduced to Dr. Hurdle. Uh, for those of you who have not uh, had the pleasure of meeting and listening to Dr. Rich, you're in for a real treat. Uh, please read his bio on the handouts. I uh, don't want to go over that right now. You can get that yourselves. Uh, it's in your information packets. And my first contact with Rich was in 1999 when he was uh, doing research at NIH, which is here in the uh, DC suburbs. And I became one of the first five adults uh, to undergo this not a re procedure. And he had to do that before he could do it on your kids. <laughs> <laughs> so there were five of us. Um, and you find he's number four in literature. Uh, as mentioned last night, uh, Rick and uh, Dr. Veloso have joined the <coughs> pioneering research uh, from which many of you have benefited and or will likely benefit in the future. There are no cures, but Rich and Lou's research and the application of that research uh, in the field uh, continue to help improve the quality of life of people with nystagmus. Uh, Rich has been a keynote speaker at five or seven AM conferences, might have been six, um, and has been providing us with in-depth information on nystagmus and the latest progress in the second research and treatment. What he presents to us is uh, not a watered-down ver layman's version of the presentation, based on the same presentation uh, that he gives to his peers. As a group, we have a better understanding of the sagas than most of the practicing uh, uh, eye professionals out there. And his, his presentations provide information as such. Uh, so it's with, with great pleasure that I present Dr. Richard Hurdle friend of Ann as our keynote speaker once again. interested in almost everything. This is the most interested audience in the, in the disease that I have an interest in. When I, and I lecture all over the world, there is no more interested audience than you. So I really enjoy talking to you. And you're all more educated, than, as Mike alluded to, than most of the audiences that I talk to. And you care more about this than most of the docs who see patients with this. <clears throat> but that's changing. And, and uh, I'm glad that it's changing. It's changing with the younger generation of docs. So I think that the I don't know and there's nothing that can be done 
things that you hear in the offices are starting to change. I want to apologize for two things before I start. The first is that um, I tend to give a technical lecture. I try and make it as easily understood as possible by those not in the science or the field that we're in here, but I do try and give a technical lecture because this is how I understand the problem and this is how I want to uh, communicate the problem. The second is that many of you or some of you may see your own pictures up here and uh, although no one else knows who they are, I think you know who they are and the way that we've learned about this problem is from you, so you may see your own photographs or pictures of you know, around here and uh, I do that routinely. <coughs> Though there's no other identification. So we're going to start by. I'm going to start by showing you a list of people which I'd like you to memorize by the end of the talk. Who <laughs> <laughs> nothing, nothing gets done alone that's worthwhile anymore. Probably never did, as long as there were two people working together to start a fire or something. And I think that the claims that things are done on their own probably are largely not true when looked at in detail. And that's certainly been true for me in my career, is that any place I've ever gone, and I've gone a few, I've always had a few uh, people around who've helped me and helped me understand this problem and been interested as much as I have. And there's been people with me throughout the path, of course, Lou and Dong Chang. Those of you who come to see us wherever we've been have met Dong Chang and, and have enjoyed his company as much as I do, has been working with me for over a decade. But these are the people who've helped me with a lot of the work that you're gonna see here today. So I'm gonna talk about nystagmus and what it is and what it means, but before uh, we get to that, I have to start from the very beginning. What are the nystagmus types? Well, nystagmus comes from the Greek word to nod, or doze off, which is what happens in most audiences, unlike this one. <laughs> Everybody goes like this. And that's what the eyes do, they wiggle, they wiggle involuntarily. But all that wiggles is not nystagmus. And the classification and characterization of these disorders has been around for thousands of years. People have noticed, as long as they've been looking at each other, that the eyes can wiggle. And, and those, those in the medical profession or, or in that culture, in the ancient Egyptian cultures, tried to characterize what that meant. What did it mean that the eyes were moving back and forth? Was it something physical? Was it something psychological? Was it something spiritual that made these people different? And depending upon what culture you were in and what time you were in, they were given different names and different meanings. So we jump to the modern age of hypothesis-driven medicine and the scientific method, which began in the late 19th century, and we start to come up with names of the types of nystagmus. And it, but it really wasn't until we could apply other things other than our own eyes to look at the oscillation itself that we start to understand what the differences are. So this is a classification. And this is a classification system that was used for almost a century. And I started, to, I used this as well when uh, I started my educational process. And now we've largely outdated it. I show some pictures up here. This is Raymond Dodge, is one of the most famous eye movement physiologist who started his eye movement research at the turn of the 20th century. This is Louis Javal, who also was a very, very famous ocular motor physiologist and crossed the boundaries between <coughs> neurology and ophthalmology like a lot of us who study the ocular motor system do. What are these 14 things are wiggly eyes as well. These are <laughs> eyes that move back and forth involuntarily. And some types of wiggly eye movements actually can be voluntary. And so these are not nystagmus. This is not nystagmus. These are saccadic oscillations. And I'll talk a little bit more about what the difference is between those two and how they can be differentiated. So what I've, what I've shown you, at least in the old classification system, is only about 55 to 60 types of eye wiggling that have been diagnosed either by, basically by observation. <clears throat> the, you may have heard from your uh, ophthalmologists or optometrists or other eye care professionals that you or your child has something called motor nystagmus or sensory nystagmus. How many of you have heard those terms before? Okay, I want you to forget them and tell your ophthalmologist never to use them again. <laughs> because this is the story of that. So this, this is another famous gentleman, David Kogan, who I had the pleasure of meeting before he passed when I was at NIH. Uh, and Lou knew him as well. And he was, he was named as one of the 20 greatest ophthalmologists of the 20th century. And he was a neuro-ophthalmologist and did a lot of research in, in Harvard before he came to uh, 
the National Alliance Institute. And in 1968, he tried to help other ophthalmologists, especially those who took care of kids' eye problems, by saying, look, here's a group of children whose eyes wiggle and have pretty good vision. And here's a group of children whose eyes wiggle and they don't see as well. So maybe there are different types of nystagmus, the ones that can see well and the ones that can't see well. <clears throat> he called them sensory nystagmus. If their eyes wiggle, then they can see well. And motor, I mean, if they couldn't see well. And motor nystagmus, if their eyes wiggled, and they could see well. Well, it turns out that um, as a result of the work by Lou and Bob Darrow, his partner at the time in the, in the late 60s and early 70s, showing that the motor oscillation, the movement of the eyes was the same, regardless of whether the child had good vision, medium vision, or poor vision. And this is a concept that is now you know, 40 years old, but people still use this in textbooks, that the, the motor oscillation is the same, even though the ability to see may be different. So, Dave Kogan recognized that in 1974, wrote a letter to Bob Darrell, Lou's partner at the time, saying basically, you know what, you're right. I was wrong to think that this was a classification system that should be used. We shouldn't use it anymore. And if you pick up a textbook now, other than the ones that Lou and I write, it says motor and sensory nystagmus in it still. So this is what happens. Um, you're part of, unfortunately, the, the propensity for the medical profession to just propel some of the old terminology based on, it, it's like, you know, I have a story about, um, I had a good friend I stayed with when I was a teenager who, who told me about his mother making meatloaf in two pans, and that was the recipe for seven Italian generations, <laughs> this delicious meatloaf in two pans, and you had to make it in two pans. And when he found out why, it was because his great, 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 great grandmother in Italy had an oven about this big, and to feed the whole family, she had to make two pans of meatloaf. <laughs> So it wasn't anything about the recipe, it was the oven. And so this is what happened to us as well, you know. <clears throat> so I was really frustrated by the fact that people weren't talking about the same disease no matter where I went. As the, my career started to grow and I would, would go around the country and then eventually around the world and present patients and talk about patients and discuss the diseases with other docs, I would be talking about a patient and they would be talking about the same patient and we'd be talking English, but saying the same different things. I was really frustrated by the lack of uniformity in the classification and characterization, not only of nystagmus, but of all eye movement disorders. There was not a uniform way to communicate about these diseases. Like there were classification systems, for example, for high blood pressure, for diabetes, for headache, for more common diseases. Even for obscure diseases like rare forms of cancer, there were uniformly agreed on classification systems. But in eye movement abnormalities, and this includes all forms of strabismus, cross-eyed, as well as uh, nystagmus, there were, were not a uniform classification system. So with the help of the Eye Institute and a group of nationally recognized experts in, uh, from all fields, including ophthalmology, optometry, neuroscience, psychology, and, and engineering, we came up with a classification system that's an 85-page document that's available free online, that's called CMAS, which is the CMAS classification system. And it's basically a living classification, so it can be added to, subtracted from, and is a starting point, especially for clinical trials. So if there's a group of professionals that want to study a particular form of eye movement abnormality, they don't have to get together and say, let's define what this abnormality is first before we study it. We've taken that hard work out of it, which is, as I've been part of clinical trials, and you get a bunch of docs in the room, the first thing they do is, all right, we're gonna study cross-eyed, esotropia, and they go, what is it? And, and everyone in the room gives a different definition, so you spend a week defining the disease before you even start the study. And we've taken the hard work out of that with this classification system. So that's what I use, and I'll show you how that's applied to nystagmus here. This is the CMAS classification system, and if you see some of the nystagmus, those of you who have nystagmus, um, if you turn your head to the side like this, then you can see the videos of the nystagmus a little better. You can see the eye movement. <clears throat> we can explain that some other time, but if you turn 90 degrees, you'll be able to see the oscillation. These are the forms of nystagmus based on CMS. Now, there, there are 11 broad categories, and within them, there are multiple subtypes. So there's at least 11 broad types of nystagmus. The ones I'll be talking about this morning, the ones that are the most common are the ones that are seen in infancy and childhood, and these are these three, infantile nystagmus syndrome, 
fusion maldevelopment nystagmus syndrome and spasmus mutans syndrome. Infantile nystagmus or INS uh, used to be called congenital motor and sensory idiopathic nystagmus or nystagmus blockage, although there's a subtype that kind of overlaps with fusion maldevelopment. This used to be called latent and spasmus mutans uh, used to be called just the same spasmus mutans. So I'll talk about those three diseases this morning. Before we do, I want, I want you to understand a little bit about what I understand. And the eye movement system, the ability to take two separate organs, one on each side of the body, and move them either independently in different directions or in the same direction, is made up of five, five separate neurological subsystems. It's not one system. There's a system that moves the eyes rapidly, either reflexively to sounds, sights, or voluntarily, if you ask to move your eyes to the right and left across the room. That's the saccadic system, that's a fast eye movement system. The eyes move at 400 degrees per second at top speed. That means they could, if they could, they can move around your whole head, past your whole head, in less than a second. That's how fast the eyes move. The pursuit system is basically involuntary, and that's tracking, if you've heard of tracking. The tracking system is the pursuit system, that's the system you use when you follow a horse race or a ping pong ball or a tennis ball or your child rolling down the slide. And that's elicited by movement. So if movement's going around the world, then your eyes will follow that. Vergence is another slow eye movement system that moves the eyes in opposite directions. Right eye to the left, left eye to the right, right eye up, left eye down, or in torsion and abs torsion. The eyes move freely in three dimensions. The vestibular ocular and the optic kinetic systems are phylogenetically, and what I mean by that is, is um, through um, evolution, if you're an evolutionist or a creation, if you're a creationist here, they move, the, these are the oldest systems. So VOR and OKN actually stabilize our body in space. Imagine the fish swimming on the bottom of the, of the ocean, and they have to know the difference between the top of the water and the bottom of the water. That's the system they use to understand that and where their prey may be. But these are very important systems for us for understanding where our body is in space, how we're related to gravity, and where motion takes place and how motion takes place. These five sub separate subsystems interact all the time. It's not like, okay, um, we take shifts. Okay, saccades off, pursuits off, pursuits off, burdens on, all right, you got to take over and you do. They work in a very complicated way all the time to give us the vision that we have. And it's the system, the motor system itself, these five subsystems, we don't think about their actions, we don't feel their actions. It's like, Tell me if your kidney's working well now. And you can go, I can't tell you if my kidney's working well. I can probably tell you my bladder's working well, but I can't tell you my kidney's working well. Because <laughs> you don't feel it. But you don't feel these. But they're just as important as the thing that you do feel in your visual system, which is sight or the input system. And I'll talk about that here uh, after. So I, we break this up. Those of us who study the visual system break up the system into two large components, the input system and the output system. The ability to get information from the world to our brain, and then what the eyes do with that information after it gets out. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about nystagmus and some of the things that you may or may not hear, and some of the delusions about infantile nystagmus, and I alluded to these in the beginning, and this is what this slide reminds me of, is that I have the delusion that this team will have this trophy. <laughs> <laughs> and they may, you know, every year at this time. Now, it turns out that no team is gonna have this trophy, <laughs> unless things get done over the weekend. So here's some of the delusions in the stagnus, that there's such a thing as sensory motor and motor. There are no dis separate diseases. There are different components of infantile nystagmus, which makes it the most complex form of nystagmus of all of them. The other ones are much more simple by standard to, to infantile nystagmus. That it's an innocent bystander that if we have a child whose eyes are wiggling and they can see 20-20, and there's few of them, there are, but most, a lot can see better than torch, can see 20-40 or better, that there are oh, their eyes, are, you're otherwise normal. You see 20-40, you go to the doctor's office and you look at the chart with nystagmus and it says 20-40, ah, oh, you're normal. That's not true and, I, and I'll convince you that you, you know that. So preaching to the choir. And that patients themselves have, are normal. Infantile nystagmus patients are normal. That we can accurately diagnose the eye oscillation by looking at you. But that we can look at you. It's the same as if I said, uh, you, you say, I feel this flutter in my chest. And I put my fingers on your wrist and say, oh, I know. You have type 1 AV heart block. And you go,
go, oh, how did you get that from my fingers? Didn't you need an EKG? And you go, no, I can tell with my fingers. I'm, you know, a super doc. I can tell with <laughs> the, the atrial electrical system is not working properly. But that's the same thing that you get when people look at your eye movements and say, uh, I can tell you what type of nystagmus you have based on your eye movements. I can't. You know, I look at the oscillation and go, oh, you need recording so I can tell. You know, because, I mean, I've seen thousands of eyes wiggling. I, I can't tell for sure. I could probably narrow it down to a few types based on the history and physical, but I can't tell you exactly what type of nystagmus you have without eye movement recordings. It's just like in, in, uh, in um, electrocardiography. And that, oh, you have nystagmus and it won't change, nothing will happen, it'll be like this your whole life. That's not true, that is absolutely not true. Nothing about a child is stable. If I had to, to, to kind of characterize infancy and childhood in one word, it would be change. If you see your child in the morning and they're a young child and you come home from work at night, even in a routine eight hour day, which probably most of you don't have, but say it's a 16 hour day, they've changed twice as much as the eight hour day. So there's no way that if the child is changing on an hourly basis that their nystagmus is going to stay the same. It just doesn't. And why should it? And that neurologists are the only patients who see, um, uh, the only docs who see patients with nystagmus. It's actually, it's really pediatric ophthalmologists and pediatric eye care professionals see more patients with nystagmus than anyone else. Because even though most of the medical profession thinks that nystagmus occurs because of middle ear disease or inner ear disease or toxicity of medications, <laughs> meniere's. The most common forms of nystagmus in the population are those occurring in association with strabismus, which are the infantile forms. So ophthalmologists see them, and if you look at the chart, it'll say, yeah, nystagmus, and then that's the last time it appears, even though they may be seen for years and years and years. <clears throat> What's important when I ask a family about what uh, they come in and say, I have a child with nystagmus. Well, it turns out that, that it's true. The our, our, we've gotten lucky and been able to observe nystagmus develop in early infancy and childhood, and it is absolutely not congenital. Having said that, there's always exceptions in medicine, and there are some genetic forms which are present in the womb. And so if, it, if a problem is present in the womb and the child is born with it, that's truly congenital. That means it's at present at birth. Most forms of infantile nystagmus are not present at birth. They're actually developmental. They're acquired. And that's really important because that tells us that something is happening in the developing system. And in, in the case of nystagmus, it's the brain. Something is happening in the developing brain somewhere between two and four months that shouldn't be happening. It's not something that happened at birth. It's not genetically programmed to happen at birth, although there may be genetic reasons for it. But it's something that occurs between two and four months. So it's something peculiar about what the brain is doing in those first few months that's causing this. That's something that said started with development at, at, uh, at the two aches, at the two cell stage. And we know this because what I started to do was ask moms about their babies and say, when you were given this beautiful baby, um, we just had our, our grandson a month ago, and my, my uh, daughter-in-law did the same thing. You know, and my wife was in the room with the delivery. What's the first thing they do? They give you this beautiful baby, and they look in the eyes. They want to look at the eyes of the baby. And I say to the moms, or whoever was in the room, were the eyes wiggling? And they go, no, they weren't wiggling. The baby looks so oh, up, and the eyes aren't wiggling. I, and the next big event is usually the first feeding. And now breastfeeding is back instead of bottle feeding. And so the moms look at the baby's eyes when they're breastfeeding, and say, were they wiggling? This is the first feed. And they go, no. So we're in the first day and there's nothing. Then the go home period is a big event, you know, when everybody goes home with the baby, which used to be three, five days later. Now it's, I think, three to five minutes later. <laughs> so when they go home with the child, they say, uh, uh, did you look in the eyes? They go, yeah. Were they wiggling? They go, no. So now we're at a day or two or three. And then the next big event is the first well baby visit, and you know everybody packs everything up, and the grandparents come, and the uncles come. This is only for the first child. The second child, if I drive. So the, the, baby, the, uh, the parent, family takes the baby in, and uh, the, the pediatrician doesn't even see any nystagmus. And it's, the child's a week old. There's no nystagmus. It's not congenital. So then you start to get to the details, and you find out that it's two to four months. And we've had the opportunity to actually follow a few babies and record them and show the evolution of the development of this disease that takes place at two to four months of age. So it's not congenital, it is not. Now there are a few genetic forms and there's always, always, you know, exceptions in medicine. So what I'm explaining to you are kind of the general rules. 
So how do we examine the kids? Well, we examine however we can. My friend who's an ex-football player and is now Mr. Mom, this is how he takes care of his kids. So they're really a lot older now, but this is uh, their favorite picture of getting the dishes done and the baby baby before mom comes home. <laughs> so we, I examine the children however I can, and I've examined kids in car seats in their cars and park benches out in the parking lot, in the cafeteria, in the hallway. I've even gone to the homes of the children to see them at their homes, in their own environment. Because sometimes you cannot examine a child. The child doesn't know, this is the doctor's office, I have to sit in the chair and pay attention. That just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen some, in some until they're about 30 or so. <laughs> so you know, we have to do what we have to do and see them. And uh, the, the thing that I, I tell my colleagues is, if anything, you have to watch the child in their natural environment because they'll do things they won't do in the chair. So if you put a child in a chair and put their head back against the headrest and ask them to read the chart, they're going to be petrified and they're not going to use their head posture. You're not going to see how they're getting around the world. You're not going to see what their visual field is like. So I like to watch them in the playroom or in the waiting room to get around. Because a child will sit in a chair with his head like this and then you throw them in the waiting room and they'll be running around like this to go to look around the waiting room. And that's much different. That shows you what effect the visual system is having on function not on sitting in the chair room. And this is, this is not just a disease of central vision, which is the least, it's a disease of functional vision. It's a disease that affects how you all function in your environment. Gl uh, giving glasses to patients with nystagmus is very tricky and it breaks a lot of the rules. And when I talk to my colleagues, I say you have to do refractions sometime without the foropter. If you stick a nose in one of those foropters, it eliminates the head postures, it covers one eye, and it will falsely give out glasses. So I use a combination of subjective and objective techniques in kids where I do retinoscopy that shows me the absolute refractive error of the eye and will try and use their head postures to help with refraction, blurring one eye, or asking the patient to use one eye at a time with both open. More than half of the patients with this, when you cover an eye, the nystagmus gets much worse, which, in, which makes vision worse, which makes visual function worse. So vision in a patient with infantile nystagmus syndrome as a person is always vision with both eyes open, never with one eye at a time, like it is in the rest of us. You know, so if vision has to be documented for some reason, driver's licenses, the military, um, school forms, that it needs to be documented under binocular conditions with the best refraction in their null position. And most other eye care professionals don't do that. When I write down what I think I see, this is one of the methods that I use, and it's actually now, we, I can do this in my electronic records as well, uh, from paper, and I'll write down what's happening in the fast phase. Intensity changes are done with more arrows or more arrow heads or more bars on the arrows, the direction, this would be the patient's left, right. So this is a more intense nystagmus in right gaze and in, in down gaze versus an up gaze. And uh, I would write it like this. This is what I put on a chart in shorthand. This says jerk right, right, jerk left and left. Null, neutral and five to eight degrees of right gaze. Anomalous head posture, horizontally distance, not near, left 10 degrees. It's horizontal nystagmus in all positions, moderate amplitude, moderate frequency, conjugate symmetric, decreases with convergence and increases and changes direction with cover. So this tells me what your nystagmus is like clinically. And most ophthalmologists don't even do any of this at all in their notes or optometrists. But this really characterizes what the nystagmus is doing to you on a clinical basis. But it also is separate from this. This is another, this is just particular to those of us who study the ocular motor system. This is the examination for strabismus. And more than half the patients with nystagmus will have strabismus. So those of you who get this examination get two separate sheets filled out, one for your strabismus, which looks like this, and then one for the nystagmus. And it's hard sometimes to separate those two. But we have to look at those as two separate but related conditions because they often will need separate treatment. The strabismus may need separate treatment from the nystagmus. The nystagmus may need separate treatment from the strabismus. Or you can use one to treat both at the same time but they need to be characterized differently. So this is the characterization, the written characterization, one of them, one of the methods that I use, it's a pretty common method, again, the patient looking at it, of a kid with uh, an exotropia, and the eyes go out. But I think that the most crucial tool to understanding eye movement uh, uh, abnormalities is really the implementation and the use of eye movement recordings or oculography or 
what, what there's different names for it. But the techniques that we generally use and that are available are these techniques up here. This is contact electrooculography. I don't use this really anymore. Some people around the world use it. It's probably better than nothing, but not much better than nothing. Uh, it, the problem with this is with the difference between all of these eye movement recording techniques are how many times each second the system is picking up information as your eyes are moving and how well that can be transmitted through the electrical system to the computers. And also how invasive it is. So this system is very is non-invasive, although these things attach to the skin. I think a two-year-old would disagree and say this is very invasive. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it also doesn't give me very good information because the monitoring of the muscular system uh, is not, and the eye movement, the eye is, is uh, basically looked at like a little battery. Um, and the front part of the eye, the cornea, is positive, or the nipple end of the battery, and the back part of the eye, the retina, is like the flat end of the battery. And so as the battery rotates back and forth, you get this positive-negative charge <coughs> that these electrodes pick up. And the problem with this is not, it's not sensitive enough to see the types of the, the staggers the way we need to <coughs> The techniques that I use most commonly are down here. And this, believe it or not, is, you all know little Alec. I don't know, he's, I haven't seen Alec around, but this is, when He's Alec was little and, and, uh, and listened to his parents. <laughs> and he, at the NR system at the NIH, but I still use occasionally this infrared system, which is a goggle system that works nice for some of the young kids, as well as adults, and it also stays as the head moves so I can see things in little babies. This is the system we've adopted, and it's really our workhorse now. Uh, this is remote high-speed video. This camera can process um, the images at, at up to a thousand hertz. That means a thousand times per second it's taking a piece of information so it really can give us accurate eye movements. And here's what it looks like on the computer screen. Here's the, what it looks like to, the, uh, to us on the computer. And you can see the, the image of the pupil in the video system. So as the eye moves back and forth, the video actually picks the pupil and reflex up and, and can check it out a thousand times per second. This we also use in research. We, this is our lab. At, uh, in Akron now, and this is a scleral search coil. This goes on the eye itself, and the patient sits in this, in this magnetic search coil. It's a very, very small magnetic field, and as the eye rotates, and the coil rotates in this magnetic field, it creates a little voltage, and that's sent back through these wires, which are amplified. <laughs> this is still the best recording system for torsion, as well as to combine vertical and horizontal at the same time, and for, to get the eye movement within seconds of arc. So this is still one of the most accurate recording systems, although it's extremely invasive. You have to use a, a drop of anesthetic to wear the lens for about 30 minutes, but we still do our research with this in adults and some older children. But this is the workhorse here. This is non-contact. It's non-invasive. The babies can actually sit on the laps of the moms, too. What do we get from this? This is what we get as the eye moves back and forth. And this is an example of a pretty simple, standard, movement of the eye back and forth in the infantile and the stagnus. The eye moves. This is the target, straight ahead. The eye is looking straight ahead. So then the eye is driven off the target. It's driven off the target by the disease. The disease says, I don't want to keep your eye steady. I want to move it. But then your saccadic system, the voluntary reflex system I talked about before, says, we can't let your eye just get driven off. We got to bring it back to where you want to see. And that's what it does. It goes back fast. So the fast phase that we all see when we look at nystagmus, when you see the eyes jerking, that's actually the corrective phase. That's the brain saying, something is going on, you're driving me off the target, bring me back. That's the fast phase. And these are just complicated ways that the brain uses the saccadic system to bring the eyes back. Or else the eyes would just rotate like this. So when you see a child who has a pure pendular slow waveform, you say, wow, this looks great. The eyes are moving nice and slow. They must see really well. That's exactly the opposite because the pe a pure pendulum never stops. It just moves back and forth. The only time the velocity is very low is when it changes direction from right to left. And that's theoretically an infinitesimally small period of time where all the jerk waveforms have periods of time where the brain captures the world more. So one of the things we noticed when we first started doing interventional therapy, medication, surgery, uh, optical therapy, was that the waveforms changed from pendulum to jerk, which meant that cosmetically some of the nystagmus looked worse. 
because the eye was moving nice and slow. And then after surgery or after medical therapy, the eyes are jerking a little more. And so the parents would say, I, this they look worse to me. I can see the nystagmus more, which is true. But the patient sees better because they went more to a jerk waveform. And interestingly, as babies develop the nystagmus, as it goes from early infancy to late infancy to early childhood, you get a natural change from the more pendular to the more jerk waveforms because those are more advantageous visually. And these are all the waveforms that we see in infantile nystagmus. And I don't expect you to memorize all of these. Uh, we still have a chart and we go through these. But these are diagnostic, so no other nystagmus has this type of waveforms. And they're all attempts of the brain to use the saccadic system to slow the eyes down. They're all different attempts to do that. These two waveforms of all the 15 here are the ones that you also see in acquired nystagmus. And all the other forms of nystagmus that are associated with brain disease, toxicity of medications, trauma, neurodevelopmental abnormalities, tumors, these are the waveforms that you see, these two very simple waveforms, a jerk waveform and a pendular waveform. So that's the difference. So if we see these, then you can see them with INS too. You can see them, especially early on, and especially in lateral gaze. But most of the time, you'll see slight variations of those. But um, so I'm going to shift gears and say, OK, I'm interested in, and I particularly study, the motor system, what's happening on the output side. But we can't separate that from the input side. Scientifically, we do. Those of us who are vision scientists Pick a, pick a side, you know, it's like um, shirts versus skins. I'm gonna, I'm gonna either do input analysis or I'm gonna do output analysis. So I'm either gonna study the retina, the optic nerve, how the brain interprets the world, where the visual pathways take us, um, what motion does and color and contrast. And this is the testing apparatus that we use to study that. So in all of the patients I see, we wanna characterize their visual system both the input side and the output side, because from the brain's point of view, it doesn't separate it, it's all operating at the same time. We artificially separate how the patient sees or senses the world from how they move their eyes, for scientific reasons. So we collect data from both sides, and that involves, this is electroretinography and visually evoked potentials. These check retinal function, all layers of the cells of the retina, as well as optic nerve function, independent of what the patient is telling us. This, takes, this is a way to check visual acuity or black letters on a white screen vision in babies. It's a behavioral method and it works very well. I'll show you a picture of this. This is called optical coherence tomography. This is testing contrast, sensitivity, color vision, and visual fields. So by testing all of these separate visual functions in patients with eye movement abnormalities, we can determine what's affected primarily by their retinal or optic nerve problem and in the stack and what gets better if we treat either. One of the newest pieces of technology is what I just showed you in the OCT, and that was a patient with albinism. And this is actually a photograph. It's a microscopic photograph as a result of a laser tomography picture of an albino retina with a good fovea showing all 10 layers of the retina, as though we took a living section of this person's retina, and we can see exactly which cell layers are abnormal structurally. This is a fascinating piece of technology that Joel Schumann, uh, my former chair and friend at Pittsburgh, developed and is now the widest piece of new technology used in ophthalmic diagnosis in adults. And we're applying this in the nystagmus population and our fellow at the time, Tara, actually did some analysis of the vertical component of this, this is horizontal, and came up with this and showed that, wow, what's going on? She showed me, I go, well, that looks like an eye movement recording. So she actually found a way to use this technology, which is in all the ophthalmologist's office, to do eye movement recording. It's just taking this image and, and mathematically, algorithmically making it into a straight line instead of this picture. And uh, the, the, the people who developed the OCT, Zeiss, are actually trying to do this. So now all ophthalmologists can do eye movement recording with their OCT equipment. So, but most, most ophthalmologists don't have eye movement recordings. They just don't. And so I don't want to wait for them to be able to use it. I don't know how many years that will take or decades that will take. So I've come up with algorithms for them to try and understand when a patient may or may not need other investigations, including uh, a neurological uh, evaluations, imaging, neuroimaging tests to worry about neurological diseases or other eye diseases. And this is really a compilation of experience working backwards. Say, okay, we take thousands of patients, 
done a complete evaluation, what is it about these patients that don't need uh, an MRI have in common, and how can I communicate that to docs so that, especially docs who can't get eye movement recordings, because I can use an eye movement recording and say, okay, this patient needs an MRI, this doesn't, but they don't have those eye movement recordings, so a lot of patients get MRIs and imaging. And the bottom line for this is that if only, the only thing wrong is the eye, if the only thing wrong is the eye itself, there's nothing else wrong with the child, then they don't need to really get imaging. So if you do a full evaluation of a child with nystagmus and their developmental milestones are fine, there's no problems with birth, labor, delivery, growth and development, there's no metabolic problems, no serious infections. So what I'm asking is a good history. If I have a good history, the parents, the pediatricians are not concerned about anything systemic at all based on just the neural well baby evaluations and the ophthalmologist finds nystagmus with something wrong with the eye, then they don't need imaging. The child doesn't need imaging. They still get imaging anyway because this is a world of defensive medicine. But from a medical point of view, the child doesn't need imaging, although a lot of kids will get imaging. CMS, this is the CMS classification of INS. This is what the box looks like. And I know there's a lot of stuff in here, but the basic criteria, this is one of the few diseases in the CMS diagnosis that has a, diagnose, a diagnostic test for it, where one thing, not all this stuff, so a lot of the other diseases, you have to put all three boxes together to come up with a diagnosis. With infantile nystagmus syndrome, it's only this. It's the only disease where if you do eye movement recordings, you get a particular type of slow face, and it's 100% diagnostic. No other disease has it. It's been reported in a couple of patients who have serious, debilitating, intensive care unit needing strokes, but <clears throat> that's not gonna be a child whose eyes are wiggling who's walking around. So if a child's eyes are wiggling and you see this diagnostic, thing on eye movement recordings, it can only be one disease. And just to give you an example, this is a three-month-old baby whose eyes were wiggling, and we got eye movement recordings on them. This, this recording tells us that the child does not need an MRI, the child has infantile nystagmus, the visual system is extremely well developed, the child's gonna see well because of the type of waveform and foveation, and the child's probably gonna have a head position with a null direction in right gaze. At three months of age, the child can't sit up, can't look around or anything. So the eye movement recordings have told us all that at three months. There is a peculiar form of, uh, that, that we've recently continued to characterize that was originally seen and reported by a body and Shalwa Hoffman reported it in their population of patients. And it's much more common in, in the uh, population of nystagmus patients with albinism. But it's seen in 17% of the overall nystagmus population and 33% of the nystagmus population with infantile, with, with albinism. And if you notice her eyes, as we start to cover, the intensity of the nystagmus is increasing, just spontaneously increasing. I mean, she's not doing anything but looking around. It's just getting worse. And it turns out, if you watch her over the course of, um, say, 10 minutes, this is what you see. And this is the eye movement recordings. What she'll have, is a spontaneously changing rhythm. And this is the velocity trace. This is up is right, down is left. And these are her eye movements. Jerk left, slows down, stops, jerk right. Slows down, stop, jerk left. Slows down, stops, jerk right. There's no other rhythm in the body. The circadian sleep, sleep, cycle, sleep wake cycle, the monthly rhythm, the heart rhythm, the rhythm that involves the movement of food down the intestinal system. There's no other rhythm that, that exists in the body that's this regular. You could set your clock by this. This is like an atomic clock. And this periodic alternating nystagmus in patients who have a rhythm like this, it's really important from the diagnostic point of view that we see this, that we diagnose this. Because if I examine the patient for this 10 seconds here, which is probably a long time for most ophthalmologists to see a patient. It's usually somewhere around six to eight seconds they see. So if you see, if the patient is seen during this six to eight seconds, they're gonna say, oh, they have jerk right nystagmus with a big right face turn. And then they'll say, oh, let's do surgery for the right face turn. And then they come in preoperatively and see the patient in the room and see them during this period and say, boy, I wrote jerk right in my chart, but now it's jerk left. I must've been wrong before, I'll just write jerk left. Or I'll see them here, and they say, wow, the nystagmus went away. You don't need surgery. You don't need any treatment. So you have to watch the patient. Now, this can be done clinically without eye movement recordings as well. The other interesting thing about this is this can occur most, it does, aperiodically, which means that 
it goes to the right for 10 seconds, slows down, it goes to the left for 30, then it goes to the right for a minute, and then to the left for 10. So there's not a pure rhythm. It's an aperiodic rhythm. And you also have to see the eye movement recordings. That's why we record the eyes for 10 minutes at the end of our recording, where I'll examine the eye for 10 minutes. And just watch while I'm examining the patient. The other thing is that this responds to different types of treatments. If you have a periodic component to your nystagmus or an aperiodic component, uh, then that seems to respond to a particular type of medication and surgery, some type better than others. So it's important to diagnose this, just like heart rhythms, certain types of heart arrhythmias respond to certain type of medications and certain type of eye rhythms respond to certain types. So what is this thing, this infantile nystagmus? What causes it? Well, it's, this is what we think causes it. Uh, this is our best hypothesis right now, at least from a conceptual standpoint. And now that you've been educated about how the visual system works with two parts, I have an output part, the motor system, and an input part, the part that sees, the part that we sense, the part that we feel, the part that I ask you about what's happening with your vision, you say I see two, or I don't see the stairs. Those two systems are separate neurologically. They have their own pathways, their own cells, their own genetically predetermined uh, uh, development. And here they go, here's the starting gun, you know, conception right here. They start to develop in the brain and in the eye. But what we don't recognize or haven't recognized in the past is that these two systems not only have their own independent development, but they communicate with each other. They talk to each other all the time. The analogy I like to use is two runners on a racetrack uh, during the race of development, but it's actually not a race, they're holding hands. So they're communicating while they're running the race, while they get to each quarter mile post or the mile post. And they communicate to each other. If they stop communicating to each other, either at birth, during development, after birth, or in infancy, then one of them speeds up in one, relative to the other one or one slows down relative to the other one. And this crosstalk between the two is what causes an unstable system. And the best way to uh, give you that analogy is if we have a baby who is developing cataracts in the womb in both <coughs> eyes, bilateral, lens opacity, and a cataract is a clouding of the lens in the same way the white of an egg gets cloudy when you fry it. So that lens is completely cloudy at birth. It develops this cloudiness in the womb, but there's no light in the womb. The child doesn't need to see light. The brain's not ready for light. The visual system is not developing yet That from that point of view. So the child is born with bilateral cataracts, and the system is developing fine until here between birth and infancy, now the brain is saying, where's my image? Send me your image, because I need to start developing vision. But it's not getting an image because the lenses are cloudy. As a result of that, the motor system keeps developing and the sensory system stops. It just stops. This break in development causes infantile nystagmus in the first 12 to 16 weeks of life. If you go in and take the cataracts out, which I, I did a 10 week old baby this week, then the nystagmus, if it's starting to develop, may actually go away, or you can stop the development of the nystagmus because you restore the communication or calibration, as we like to say in the engineering terms, as Lou uses here, between the system, the calibration that recontinues. So infantile nystagmus is the result of a miscommunication between the developing ability to see and the developing ability to move the eyes that's manifest in the first two to four months of life. That's what infantile nystagmus is. This is what it looks like electrically, and Lou will explain that to you. <laughs> this is how we look at the brain, not as a series of sponges and hormones and chemicals, although it's really important. We look at it as kind of an electrical box of how it's functioning, and as a result of computer modeling, and this is really where uh, I think Lou's great contribution has come into, is this system here, this pursuit system that's abnormal, can actually be modeled and we're looking for the cells in the neurological system that make this box up, because there are cells that make this up. And if we can find those cells and restore their normal ability at the right time, then we will cure infantile nystagmus. But we have to find the cells that function this way, and we're working on it. The other type of nystagmus that occurs that's commonly confused with infantile nystagmus is fusion valve development, or latent, and it can look just like infantile nystagmus. It's horizontal. It occurs, uh, changes direction in right and left gaze. It can change direction with cover. It changes intensity with cover. It presents during the same period of time in the first two to four months. It's always associated with strabismus, either the eyes crossing in or out or up or down. 
So it's extremely difficult to differentiate between the two. And this is a, this is a patient who has um, eyes who are crossed. Her eyes are crossed and she prefers her right eye. It's hard to tell that her eyes are, are crossed here with both eyes open. And she also has a very minimally to non-perceptible nystagmus with both eyes open. You have to really be uh, good to see that. But this is what other clinicians would call pure latent nystagmus. If you cover the right eye, she jerks left. If you cover the left eye, she jerks right. There's a variable intensity between the two eyes. When you record the eye movements, what you see is with the right eye open, she has jerk right nystagmus, which is up with linear and decreasing velocity slow phase, linear and decreasing. And with the left eye, it's jerk left with decreasing velocity slow phases, typical for fusion mal development, not increasing. These are decreasing, they're going back. Plus the right eye has better vision than the left. You can see this yourself. You don't have to be a genius to see the difference between its two eyes and say, which eye do you think is better? Well, this eye looks like it's better. It's smaller, it's more regular, the fixation's better, look at this one. So you can tell this in a child who's non-verbal, you can tell which eye is better, which eye may have amblyopia. Now here's another child who's got esotropia, same thing, a little bit. You can see the esotropia. When the child fixes with the left eye, it's jerk left. And when the child fixes with the right eye, it's jerk right. So does this child have infantile nystagmus, fusion maldevelopment, or neither? So this is this child's recordings. And you can see here with both eyes open, it's jerk right with increasing velocity waveforms. It switches to jerk left, and then jerk right with the right eye. So this is infantile nystagmus with the latent component. But you can't tell this without the recordings. They look the same, and the treatment for the two is the same, different. The treatment for fusion maldevelopment is get that child to use both <coughs> eyes together. More importantly, the infantile nystagmus patient is both get the eyes to use together and reduce the nystagmus from surgery and medication. So it's two different treatments. Uh, a friend and colleague, Larry Tyson, is a very bright guy and in St. Louis uh, is doing animal work with infantile nystagmus and found a neural mechanism. And it turns out that what we thought about with this abnormal crosstalk is what's happening neurologically. This is a section of the brain, which is like a sandwich. The cortex is like a sandwich of a six layer sandwiches. One of those uh, New York deli sandwiches. <laughs> with six and there's six layers over the whole cortex. And in the visual cortex, the top, this is layer two, three, four, B and four C. And you can see that the nerve cells in a patient who has normal, normal binocular function and no latent nystagmus, the cells talk to each other. That's what these neurons are. And the cells in a patient who, d who does have latent nystagmus don't talk to each other. They go straight down. This is right eye cell, left eye cell, right eye cell, left eye cell. They don't talk to each other. And he found this out functionally and histologically. Again, confirming the fact that this crosstalk of communication that occurs in the cortex is responsible for most forms of oscillations. The last form we're going to talk about in childhood is spasmus nutans syndrome. And this is a very peculiar form of nystagmus that is clinically very different. It appears very different to us than uh, the other two. But it can be confused occasionally. And what we see with this is a child who has a triad of this peculiar type of head bobbing, which is different than the head oscillation seen in more than half the patients with infantile nystagmus. More than half the patients with infantile nystagmus will do this horizontal head oscillation <coughs> that is the same motor output to the neck muscles as the eyes. We think that this SN oscillation may be in some ways a, an attempt of the baby to slow this eye oscillation down. The peculiar thing about this oscillation is that the right eye is going to the left when the left eye is going to the right. And that's where we see this out of phase, 180 degree out of phase oscillation. It's the only oscillation that occurs like this where there's out of phase uh, uh, components. So it's eminently diagnosable with eye movement recordings. It's pretty classic. The downside with this is you have to get an MRI in these patients because a small percentage, a very small percentage, will have tumors of the optic pathway, gliomas, or cranial pharyngiomas, above where the pituitary and the chiasm are. Now, I've set, probably seen 20 or 25 patients with spasmus nutans, and I only have one that has this tumor. It's very rare. We don't actually even call it spasmus nutans syndrome if they have the tumor because the nystagmus is a little bit different. This patient did not have. This patient had, it was benign spasmus nutans up here. But this is the few, one of the few syndromes where I will order an MRI just to be sure. Because these are treatable. These uh, tumors are treatable.
but not all eyes that wiggle are nystagmus. And here's a patient whose eyes have been wiggling for uh, months to years, and this is her eye movement recordings, which show no slow phases. It's all fast, fast up, fast back, fast up, fast back, fast up, fast back, with a little bit of an inner saccadic interval. And these are the types of oscillations that she has. These are saccadic oscillations. These are a result of different areas of the brain having an abnormality, usually the cerebellum and the brainstem areas that are phylogenetically older, that are responsible for gross motor movements, some fine motor movements, balance and coordination. And these types of abnormalities are, are, are most often worked up. If we see this, a saccadic oscillation, I just had a baby the other day with this, where I saw a saccadic oscillation that looked like this and this, um, it's called opsiclonus, and those kids need to be worked up for other diseases. So it's, but it looks like nystagmus, the eyes are wiggling. Clinically, the eyes just go back and forth. If you're careful, you can say, I think it's saccadic, but you don't know unless you do eye movement recordings. But it's pretty clear on eye movement recordings what the problems are. So what happens to the visual system? Well, you guys who have it can tell me, but the ones that don't, I'll, I'll tell you what I think is going on. And there's objective abnormalities that we see in the patients, and they're subjective things that the patients tell us. And the objective things are the retinas and optic nerves are maldeveloped, underdeveloped, anomalously developed, not working properly. And many of the patients, probably half to two thirds of the patients with infantile nystagmus have other problems with the afferent system side. They don't use the eyes together. One of the two eyes is often better than the other one, 50% or greater as a result of the brain picking one to be stronger. They often, up to 80 to 90% of patients will have significant refractive errors that need correction early on in infancy or childhood. And a recently diagnosable condition that occurs, and it's usually not noticed until the child's really challenged in the academic environment, is the inability to use the lenses inside the eyes well. And this happens to every single one of us if we're fortunate enough to live long enough where we need reading glasses. But in patients with nystagmus, they can have underuse of the lenses, especially if it's associated with other syndromes or diseases of the eyes, such as albinism, achromatopsia, and iridia, where the le that for some reason those patients stop being able to use the eyes early in childhood, even early in the teen years or definitely in the college years. So this needs to be checked. It's a, it's a simple thing to do to check them. If we look at the uh, system, say, particularly of albinism, which is the most common form of other associated disease, if we took other associated visual system diseases in, as a group in patients with nystagmus, most of them, more than half, have uh, some form of albinism. And what you see in albinism in the visual pathways is this. This is the optic chiasm. Here's the right nerve and the left nerve coming together. And if you look at the width of the chiasm from here to here, it's much narrower in albinos than it is in the normal person. And what they're missing is the is fibers that go along this pathway to the brain on the same side. So fibers from this eye split, half go this way and half go this way. Fibers from this eye split, half go this way, half go this way. In albinism, the ones that go to the same side are underdeveloped or missing, which is why it's narrow. And this is an extremely diagnostic test Albinism. It's probably better than most genetic tests because if they don't have the gene, it's not sensitive. It's specific if you can find the gene. But this is present in all albinos. The problem is this chiasm is two millimeters thick. So to get a scan to see this requires a lot of cooperation by the patient and by the radiologist to see a structure that's two millimeters thick, and that's the actual structure of one millimeter with an MRI, or it doesn't happen with a CAT scan. And we're developing a protocol to be able to look at this. The woman that did this is in, in, the, in Sweden, and she's done a lot of work with albinos and has a specific MRI protocol to look at this. What do you say when you have nystagmus to us? Well, you say, I can't see, which usually means I can't see detail. I can't see black letters on a white screen in the ophthalmologist's office. I can't see color as well. Uh, my contrast is down, and you don't say I have decreased contrast sensitivity, there's other descriptive words for that. It's hard for me to read, it's hard for me to move around the world, it's hard for me to follow things, like a baseball coming at me, it usually hits me in the face, so I don't do it. The, the how, where I can see, I can't see as well to the sides because I have to turn my head. It takes me longer to find something when it's being presented to me, and it's visual recognition time, and I, I, I can't look to the sides and see as clearly as I can if I turn my head. My balance may be off. My ability to deal with spinning um, or, or diving or, 
or doing a flip in a pool. And I'm also light sensitive in many ways, not just light sensitive, but light gets in the way of my vision. I want to talk about head posturing. Head posturing is not a simple thing. This is a model that we came up with, that Lou and I came up with, that explains the null position. Here's a patient with a left face turn. Pretty simple, right? The, left, the face is turned to the left, the eyes go to the right, because that's the position in space relative to the brain where the eyes are, are slowed down the most. Why is it this way? What makes this up? Well, it's all of these factors. So this is why treating a head posture is more difficult than just saying, okay, the eyes are to the right, I'll just move them to the left, and that will fix them. And so doing that clinical approach works most of the times, but many times it doesn't, because a head position is much more complicated than just the eyes are to the right, I'm moving to the left, everything will be okay after that. So we'll talk, I'll talk about treatments, because that's what most of uh, the audiences I talk to now, that we understand the disease together. How do we treat the disease? Well, the first thing I can say is I can't cure it. If I could cure nystagmus and make the eyes completely stop, I would, but I can't, and I don't know how. I think that the best way to do that in the future is to be to intervene early, and we'll talk about how you can do that genetically, or intervene early neurologically <coughs> by finding the cells and rewiring those as the motor system is developing. And hopefully in my lifetime we'll have those treatments available. But until then, the only thing we have are treatments and non-cures. And so what a treatment means by definition is to make things better, not make things go away. And you'd be surprised how many times I say that to families. Even if it's surgery, I'll say, I'm gonna make this better. And the next day after surgery, the family say, well, you know it's not gone. And I'll say, yeah, I know it's not gone. But it's not unusual. I mean, we've done studies where we've given informed consent and the patient has walked out of the room and someone else has said, what did the doctor inform you about? And they have no clue. So this is pretty common. And so I have to keep saying it over and over and over again. What I have are treatments and not cures. It's unfortunate, it's the reality of where we're at, it's why we continue to do research, because if we had a cure, then it would stop and move on to something else. But we don't have that yet. So what we have are treatments. And the more treatments and the less cures we have, the more things we have to treat with. As you get close to a cure, then it becomes one thing. As you get further away from a cure, it becomes more things because treatments then become varied and wide. So the more treatments there are for a condition, the less there are a chance of a cure. And I have three treatments that, we, uh, that I use. Medical treatments, optical treatments, and surgical treatments. And all work in slightly different ways and all seem to be additive in making the visual system better, not just in the stagnants. Because remember that patients, most patients have input problems and output problems. And if we treat both of those, then we make the visual system more normal. We don't just treat one, we try and treat as much of the abnormalities as possible. And I think that that's the key that I tell my colleagues is find out what all the problems are in the input and output system, treat all the problems you can as early as you can. And if you do that, then you'll maximize the visual potential of the child or the infant. And optical treatment is as important to me as surgical treatment, and it's actually as profound. The one-two punch for most of the treatment that I do is optical and surgical. And optical involves um, glasses, low vision aids, but very importantly, contact lenses. And with any amount of, of, uh, of uh, prescription, a contact lens is extremely important. It provides four huge advantages to patients with nystagmus. The first is optical quality of contacts is better than glasses, and that's true for everyone. The second is that the, uh, the, the patient can use an eccentric null position with their contacts, even if it's a small one or a large one that you can't use with glasses, especially the chin up, chin down that are present in patients with optic nerve, retinal disease, and albinism, who often have chin up and chin down positions. So the child with a chin up or chin down position in glasses has to choose. Do I see better with my null position over the glasses, or do I see with my head straight out of my null position through the optics of the lens, unless they do this, you know? But with a contact lens, they don't have to do that. They can actually look up or down or tilt a little bit and the lens moves with the eyes. The third is that you eliminate light sensitivity and light interference. Those are two separate problems that occur, particularly in the albino population. Light interference is light that comes in the eye that's not supposed to. So it interferes with the normal optical ray that comes through the pupil. That's why the pupil is supposed to change size and provides a diaphragm like an F-stop on a camera. 
And the light that's coming in around the pupil is interfering with the light that's coming through that the brain is trying to pay attention to. And the second is photophobia or light sensitivity, which is pain due to the light. So the contact, the contact lens that is tinted or peripherally painted will get rid of light interference and light sensitivity, photophobia, or pain. And the fourth thing is that the contact lenses, actual physical contact with the eye will slow the nystagmus down and improve the quality of the beat-to-beat -beat oscillation. So contact lenses are my one-two punch, and I tell the families, I recommend, look, try the contact lenses as soon as you can. You mean like tomorrow? I go, yeah, tomorrow's good. You can wait till you get home, though. But I want you to try. <laughs> and if it doesn't work this year, then as a family, try it next year. If it doesn't work next year, then try it the following year. If it doesn't work the following year, don't wait until they're 13 or 15. It's not cosmetic age-related lens. It's a medical device. And try as a family to get it in as soon as you can. And with expert contact lens fitting that's available now, to find someone that will work with you, there's usually someone in every city. If you're persistent, and most of you are, that's why you're here. If you're persistent, you can find someone who will help you fit a contact lens. And I'm spending a lot of time on this because this is important to me as surgery. It actually worked. The two together really helped quite a bit. Medical treatments, I'm using more and more and more of. Actually, I see this as the final common pathway. Hopefully, someday surgery won't be for nystagmus, but for the other associated conditions. And it will be contact lenses and medications. And the medications are becoming more refined now. And the indications for use in nystagmus are becoming better. Without going into a lot of detail, the ones that I use most commonly are these three here. Vementine or Nemenda is FDA approved for the use in Alzheimer's, but it also helps certain types of nystagmus, particularly acquired pendulum nystagmus, and it also does help infantile nystagmus in some patients as well. And I don't use Nemenda in the kids or young children because of the, some of the neurological side effects, but in older children or adults, we'll give it a shot. This is a phenomenal new medicine now. It's called Ampira. It's, it's uh, used in multiple sclerosis patients, as well as restless leg syndrome. It's approved for, uh, for uh, multiple sclerosis to help with walking, but it also has an incredible effect on downbeat nystagmus, an acquired form of nystagmus due to brainstem or cerebellar disease. The Empire is very expensive, and you have to go through this little insurance rigmarole to get it. But it is, a, it's a targeted, like, antibiotic drug for a certain form of nystagmus. The one I use most commonly in young children and adults is baclofen, which has been around forever and is used uh, for spasmodic disorders in children, usually CP, and the kids have baclofen pumps on. It's usually an antispasmodic. But it seems to knock out the, periodic the periodicity of PAN and APAN. So in patients who have a periodic component to the nystagmus, it smooths it out. So they spend more of their time in the less intense form of nystagmus. So it improves their visual behavior. It gives them their best vision more of the time. And I don't know in which patient it works all the time. In the pure periodic patients, it works about 80% of the time. In the aperiodic patients, it works about a third of the time. And so I will give it a month to two trial. There's minimal side effects, but and they're transient. A little bit of fatigue, a, a fatigue, a little bit of sedation, and uh, sometimes some nausea, but that usually goes away. But it, it has a large safety profile and has been used for decades in the pediatric population. So I, I've been prescribing it if I see a periodic or a periodic component and I move it accordingly. But you can see there's a list of other medical treatments here that we can try. But the best way to get a, to treat them is, is genetically. Now these puppies, this is the Briard sheepdog puppy. This is the animal model that we use to study nystagmus and we'll be using soon again too. And if you look at this dog, let me see if I can go backwards again. I don't know if any of you can see it. But this puppy has nystagmus. You can see the limb is wiggling. And this puppy has a genetic defect of the retina, an RP65 deficient gene in the, in the retinal pigment epithelial cells, which are under the retina and nourish it. And as a result of this, they have labor's congenital amaurosis, or in the dogs, it's congenital stationary night blindness. This is the puppy six weeks after injection of uh, adenovirus-associated gene therapy under the retina. And the, the retina is now functioning. The dog sees. The dog was peripherally night blind and peripherally blind here. Night blind and peripherally blind. The dog can now see. The ERG that checks retinal function has almost normalized, and the nystagmus is pretty much gone. And that's from gene therapy of the primary retinal disease during that development. So uh, we thought this was science fiction, it's now science fact. I hope that in some 
at some point I can say, oh, your, yeah, your child has a stagnus. Here's the gene defect. I'm going to take it to the OR. I'm going to put the gene under the retina or in the optic nerve. The retinas and optic nerves are going to start to function normal, and the stagnus is going to go away, and the vision is going to become normal. This is science fiction. It's now science fact. And we're starting more and more human trials with these. Although the AA2 virus, which has been used for this, is now being replaced by the AA8 virus. These adenovirus is the common cold virus. It's attenuated, so it's kind of manipulated, so it doesn't cause a cold anymore, but it can be used to infect the cells with the gene. So this is in your child's lifetime, certainly in your child's child's lifetime, to be a routine treatment. But that's the way to cure it. That's the way to cure this disease. And we don't have it yet, but we're getting there. When I want to talk about surgery, because a lot of you hear about surgery and what it means, and this is one of, I would consider one of the fathers of eye muscle surgery for nystagmus, and his, his name is Anderson from the anderson Kestenbaum procedure. This is his portrait picture when I was in uh, Melbourne, Australia. This was in the, uh, in the lecture hall, and he was one of the famous neuro-ophthalmology professors there. And he writes in his textbook in 1959, it's been found that such operation may greatly lessen torticollis, that's head posturing, but also may improve vision by lessening the stagnus. So in 1959, this keen observer says, you know what, when I operated on these kids for their head posture, it seemed like their nystagmus got better and their vision got better. And that was completely ignored by the medical profession. I, I don't know why, but it was for decades. And I'll come back to the story. But I have to talk about what we mean by visual acuity, because that seems to be the most important thing to anyone who talks about uh, uh, eyes in the visual system. And for me, visual acuity or black letters on a white screen is just a measure. It's just like blood pressure, pulse, respiration, temperature is. It's a vital sign measure of the eye. It doesn't really mean that much, except maybe, yes, to get your driver's license. But even that, if the world was just black letters on a white screen, we'd be seeing what would be, what would be the equivalent of an old Disney cartoon, you know, that Mickey Mouse cartoon. That's what the world would look like. But the world doesn't look like that. It's full of color. <coughs> it's full of contrast and depth. That's what's affected in patients with nystagmus, not necessarily black letters on a white screen. Having said that, in order for me even to get our papers published, I have to measure black letters on a white screen, or else don't even look at my papers. Even though I say, this is not, a, I'm trying to make the nystagmus better. That's the goal of this therapy. Uh, that's why I'm writing the grant for. That's what I'm doing the study for. And they go, oh, but we need to measure vision. I go, but that's not what I'm studying. I'm studying the nystagmus. But we need you to measure vision or we're not going to, I'm telling you, this is the kind of battle that we've been dealing with. So I talk about vision and I measure vision, even though I think that it's probably not that important. And having said that, we do measure it. And what we measure is there's many different types of vision. There's not, it's not just black letters on a white screen, because you can take the black letters and do different things with them and get different measures of visual function. So if I measured your vision, black letter and white screen, this way, I may get 2010. If I measure it this way, I may get 2040. If I measure it this way, I may get 2200. So it depends on how I measure it, what techniques I measure it with, what number I get, and what the number means. And usually for us, when we communicate with patients, the number means, can I get my driver's license? Can I go fly a fighter plane? Can I you know, work at Dairy Mart? I don't know. So that's what the number means. But it doesn't mean as much to me because I'm studying the motor system and I want to make that better. All right, now I'm going to come back to the uh, eye muscle surgery. So Lou um, had this idea. I don't know, he woke up with him one day after one of his uh, nightly cocktails or something. <laughs> These ideas came into his head. That's, that there was something about the surgery that was making the nystagmus um, better. Something, maybe, maybe it was just cutting the muscle. And I said, he, he approached that idea to me and I said he was crazy, that he should stop drinking what he was drinking. <laughs> because there was no way that that was gonna um, be true. But I went along with him anyway, because I, I do. And we, he found this animal model of nystagmus. The These are different dogs. These are Belgian sheep dogs. And they have achiasma. They have no chiasm. The optic nerve goes right back to the brain. These are the opposite of albinos. And they also have nystagmus. So in the mid-90s, we were able to do what Lou had hypothesized, which was just take the muscle off the eye and reattach it at the original insertion. This is what usually happens during a strabismus operation. The muscle is taken off and moved back. What we did in the dogs was we just took the muscle off, they have nystagmus, and put it back on, and we checked their visual behavior and their eye movement recordings, and it turned out that the effect of surgery was just the effect of cutting the muscle. 
So we, the effect on them is staggers. And of course we were confused by that, but we still continued to pursue the research. And as a result, we did two cl human clinical trials of which Mike alluded to before. And look, Mike is doing pretty well nine years after the surgery, although I think the, the most effects are 10 years. Where are you, Mike? You have a year to go before we see what happens to you from being part of a clinical trial. <laughs> He's gonna be fine. He's fine. If there's any problems, it would have happened. <laughs> but I don't know. We're, we're. <laughs> um, so uh, Mike was part of one of the. We did five. We did ten adults and five children, and showed the same effect. So we showed that the nystagmus actually gets better by just cutting the muscles alone. And this is what this is what it looks like. Here's cutting the tendon, and what we've done is label this as the anthesial part. And there was something about this area of the tendon that is causing the brain to change. And this is what the eye movement looks like. And I, I show this for a bunch of reasons. If you look at the number of times the eye goes back and forth here, this is a second, 43 to 44 is one second. It goes back about four to five times per second. And here is one second here, 83 and a half, 84 and a half. It goes back and forth about the same number of times per second, but this is where the brain sees with the arrow. See how much longer the brain sees for each beat. But if you look at the eye clinically, if you just look at this patient's eyes, they're still going back and forth at three to four times per second. There's no one that I know of that can tell the difference before and after surgery looking at this patient's eyes saying there was a difference. It's only with eye move recordings and doing visual function tests that you can see that this is better. And this is a good example of a little girl who's a pretty typical childhood uh, partial albinism, OCA1, uh, OCA2A, whose chin is down, eyes are up, this is a pretty typical posture. And this is what the eye movement recordings look like in the null position, in up gaze, on the right eye, position velocity, left eye, position velocity before surgery. Her eyes are up here. And then after surgery, her head is straight. Wow. And here's her nystagmus. Right eye, position velocity, left eye, in the null position. So her best nystagmus, her best nystagmus is here before, and her best nystagmus is here after. And here's her head position and her eyes are surgery. So um, this is the kind of effect you can get from uh, these procedures. But it turns out there's no one operation. And as I started doing more and more of this and understanding this and approaching this in a scientific manner, we found out that the surgical procedures for nystagmus can be broken up into nine separate types. It wasn't just one. So what we, what we studied when we studied this was um, just only the uh, this, operation number six. No head posture, no strabismus, and no getting better when the eyes cross. Only 9% of those patients, 9% of the patients that I've operated on had that alone. But tenotomy, cutting the muscle, is part of every operation. It's just that everyone differs because I either move the muscle or take a piece out. Because operation number one and two, which are the most common ones, are because of the head posture, chin down, chin up. And then operation three is strabismus alone, strabismus plus the head posture. So if we take these four, that's what we do most commonly. But in all of them, it's actually cutting the muscle. So we're helping the nystagmus, eye position, and head position. And this pretty much bears out. I studied these patients, a uh, 100 of these prospectively, and followed them for years to do some more data analysis. But this is an algorithm that can be used by clinicians almost without eye movement recordings, almost. If they see this, if they see a child whose head is like this and has, has a strabismus, they can do this operation with the horizontal strabismus and fix the child with one procedure. So what gets better? What have we studied? These things in red are the things that we've studied prospectively in these populations, and these are the tests of them. And all of these things improve. Even though our initial goal was to make the nystagmus better, assuming if we made the nystagmus better, visual functions would improve. But since we were taking all, doing all the measurements of all the input functions, we, uh, we reported those as well. And these are the things that really get much better. The best acuity, 75% of patients as a group will get one to three lines better. 25% um, black letters on a white screen will not change, will not. Other visual functions will improve, but 75% visual acuity will be better. And the head posture will improve. If you do surgery for a head posture, all of them will improve in the head posture. You know, and I'll, I'll talk about what, why patients need more surgery. The null position improves in everyone. The size of the null position, and I'll show you that diagrammatically, so it means 
something to you gets better. The amount of time during each beat that the brain sees the world gets better in every patient. Their ability to see the world clearer to the sides gets better in every patient. And 80 to 90% of patients who fill out a, some type of questionnaire about how they function in the world visually say they're much better after eye muscle surgery. So this is, again, black letters on a white screen that we use, and this is the data, 75% one to three lines. 15% get greater than three lines. This is what it looks like in the 100 patients that are studied prospectively, showing that the patients who start out with the worst acuity actually improve the best. In statistics, this is called the regression to the mean. If you don't have a lot to go, you're not gonna get a lot better. So it turns out that if you come in with lower vision, you have a chance of gaining more vision after the surgery. This again is an example of what this looks like. This is even more dramatic. This is a five times per second oscillation and a five times per second oscillation before and after surgery. And the difference in what the brain gets per beat is 16 versus 70 milliseconds. And that's huge in brain time. So with more than double to triple the amount of information the brain is getting during each beat. But if you look at the eyes with your naked eye before and after surgery, it doesn't appear to be a change. The heart's beating before therapy, the heart's beating after therapy. How did I change it? Well, we have to look at the EKG to tell. This is Dr. Yang, who, does, who poses for all of our data and equipment before we give it to try it on patients, because he builds half the stuff himself. And we're showing that the head posture improves in every patient. Now, we've known head postures have improved since the 50s. That's been the indication that Dr. Anderson came up with and Kestenbaum helped with and Goto in Japan. But interestingly, when I lecture overseas, especially in Europe, they don't operate even for head posture because their belief is that it doesn't get better. They say it doesn't work. They say Sir, eye muscle surgery for head posture and nystagmus does not work. And that was the exact sentence by the, by the head of this pediatric and strabismus service at Moorfields Eye Hospital, one of the most famous eye hospitals in the world to me. And I say, oh, really? And he goes, yeah. And I go, okay. So I collected more data to show that it would work. And uh, I went back recently and they said, we don't believe you. <laughs> what can I say? I don't know. It's not, it's not a faith, it's fact. So, but one of the things we have discovered, and we've been really interested in functional, or what it means functionally, because when I first started doing this, the patients say, you know, I see so much better, I get around so much better, and I was really curious about trying to understand what that meant. And so, what we started doing was measuring visual function as a function of gaze. So, when, the, when, you and, when, when those of us who don't have nystagmus look to the sides, right, left, up, or down, um, I can see the world exactly the same. It looks exactly the same to me. I, I don't see any difference, except when my nose gets in the way. But for those patients with nystagmus, as they look away from their null position, and every single patient with infantile nystagmus has a null position, half are straight ahead and half are up or down to the sides. When they look away, the world degrades. Everything about vision degrades. And so what they have, and what you have, is actually in what I, I think of as an ice cream cone of vision. Inside the ice cream cone is where you see well, outside is where you don't. And we check this by actually measuring visual function as we turn the head. And this is an example of what the data looks like. And before and after surgery, preoperatively, going down is better vision and going up is uh, worse vision. And here's a patient that in their null position here, got only one log, more, one log more better, one line better, straight ahead. But if we check them outside the null position, away from that, look at how much better they got. So they maintain this good acuity across a wide field of gaze. So prior to this, people were just measuring vision and saying, oh yeah, they only get a line better, we don't care. But if you measure their foot 10, 10 degrees over, 20 degrees over, 30 degrees over, they're getting two, three, four, five lines better. And that really makes a difference in how the world is. And here's an artist representation with Roger Davis of what is happening. This is the ice cream cone of vision on the Jersey Turnpike. Any of you have been on the Jersey Turnpike know that you can do this because you have to stop every 15 feet. So you can make these photographs without problems. And here's straight ahead, and here's to the side. This is what the world may look like to a person with nystagmus as you look away from the null position. What we thought happened after surgery was this. You take the null position and move it here. What happens after surgery is this. You take the null position, move it here, and it expands. What that looks like in 3D is this. So the three-dimensional field of vision, here's the ice cream cone, and here's before, 
Up at close, there's a wide area of good vision, and far away, it's small. And then after surgery, this is what happens. So the field of functional vision expands. So here's the beneficial effects of eye muscle surgery. You improve acuity, you improve head posture, you improve the null zone, you improve the beat to beat capture of the world, you improve vision to the side, you improve how quickly, the, uh, you, quickly you see the world, you, you feel like you see better, so you probably have a sense of better self-esteem, confidence, and get, get, get around better in the world. You can process motion better, so you can play sports and watch sports better, or whatever you like to do in motion. And it's independent of what you operate for, whether you operate for eye crossing, uh, head posture, both, or you just take the muscles off and put them on. <coughs> why does this happen? Well, the answer is I don't know, but we'll tell you why we think it's happening. So I was, again, very curious about why it happened, so I enlisted the help of some friends at NIH. Um, Chi Cho Chow is a very famous international pathologist, and I said, I want to look at this area of the eye where we're cutting. What's happening where we're cutting there? So I went back through the archival literature to look at the anatomy and physiology of this part of the eye, and it wasn't there. Because when the eye is sent for pathology, it's cut there and the eye is sent. If the muscle is sent for pathology, it's cut there and the muscle is sent. So the cut area is the area I want to look at pathologically, and it's always destroyed by preparing the specimen. Mm -hmm. So we developed a surgical technique where we preserve this area of the eye and send it for pathological analysis, and this is what we found. Nerves, sensory nerves, nerves that feel, that tell you where, tell the brain where the eye is in space. And so, as to make a long story short, since then, um, there's been researchers all around the globe that have studied these nerves and found that they're, in, they're really important in determining how the eyes move by their connections to the brain, stem, and cerebellum. So by manipulating these nerves surgically and or medically, we've slowed the nystagmus. What we think is happening is the best way that I like to describe it from a conceptual point of view is that we're rebooting the system. By cutting these nerves or using medications on the nerves, we're rebooting the system and telling the brain, look, you have a second chance to get better. And it does, it reestablishes new connections, neuroplasticity. Another way to look at this is traumatic, peripherally induced traumatic brain injuries. We know that this is an enhanced period of plasticity and regeneration, I know I'm, I'm going over, I'm sorry, uh, after this. So what does this mean for the future? What this means is that what we've done is we've shown that there are some eye drops that may help. And this was done, this is an oral study with a, a, a medicine that works on those nerve terminals. And as you go up here, the nystagmus gets better. And so this is the nystagmus as a function of gaze with just looking without anything, looking with contact lenses, looking with the oral Diamox pill, and then with convergent stamping, showing that the best is with looking at near. But here's the difference with the, with the oral Diamox, which is an oral medication. And now, what we've done is use topical medications showing that the nystagmus increases. And as a result of that, we now have a clinical trial where we're comparing this topical in a placebo-blinded, double-mass fashion uh, this ASOP to a control to see if this works on the nystagmus. And the last thing is we've also begun to attack the head oscillations on nystagmus that occur in 50% of the patients, and we're coming up with a uh, trial, a cervical dystonia specialist and I, to inject botulinum toxin in the suboccipital triangle, which, which are responsible for the small titubations of the head that occur in infantile nystagmus. So we're hoping within the next year or so we have this particular treatment as well that will stop the head oscillations that are really cosmetically and socially uh, a, a problem for most patients with nystagmus. And I'll leave you with this, uh, because it is, a lot of this work may seem like it's factual to you, and I present it in a very confident way, because I'm confident of it, but there's still a lot of people around the world that either don't know of this, or if they hear of this, don't believe of this, or if they hear of this and maybe believe in it, don't care to, to learn more about it. And so this is a very good friend of mine, Sevier Zeki, who's a world famous neurophysiologist who's funded, the single largest funded scientist in the world. He has two of his own fMRI units and he's funded by the Catholic Church. Has three visits with the Pope. He studies, there's some interesting books. He studies love, maternal, <coughs> maternal, love and the brain and art and aesthetics in the brain and why we as humans appreciate those and have those. He's a really cool guy. We were with him, this is in one of my favorite trips that's Gloria, New Zealand. We were in New Zealand. 
Thanks for your attention. That's a good question. So the question is about billing and coding, uh, insurance-wise and reimbursement for eye muscle surgery. No, there's a code for the tenotomy procedure, so it's reimbursed. It's not considered experimental. It's a 962 code. Yeah. Yes? My nephew is Alex Obit. He just got his driver's license, and I was just curious about how you're dealing with or your, your science is dealing with the law enforcement, because with drinking and drugs, you get that um, type of nystagmus from that. So right. are they being trained on how to work for that and stuff? No, they're just ignoring the nystagmus. So if I tell the kids, they ask me this, I go, you can't drink and get away with it with your nystagmus. <laughs> the cops don't use just nystagmus. They barely use it anymore. Um, so there's two things with that. One is that if they suspect something's up, they're going to find it other than the nystagmus. The second is I've actually made some cards for my patients saying this patient has an eye condition that causes the eyes to wiggle with my name on it, so they can give them that. But I've done that with some patients, and you know, if the cop is only using the nystagmus, then that's rarely ever the case. They, the field sobriety testing is much more comprehensive than just going like this. And no policeman that I'm aware of only uses the eye movements as part of their field sobriety test. So it's much more common. If that's the only thing, they'll usually let you go. You know, and so, but I do have on the back of my business cards, it's laminated a little bit. I give out some of my patients who want it. So if you want it, it's not gonna be a, a, a get out of driving drunk pants. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and, and don't call me up from jail, you know? Don't call me up from jail. The kids go do that. I don't wanna do that anymore. Well, it's like you said, we don't have the luxury of having any alcohol in our system be, be before getting behind the wheel. We just don't. And there are other medical conditions too, you know, diabetics have this issue and seizure patients who may now get partial licenses. Um, I'm not sure what the right answer is, but my experience has been that that's not the only thing they take them in for. So I've never I've never heard of anyone getting going through the system only because of their mistake. Oh, it happens. I get lawyers calling me all the time. Only one person here who has had that issue. But there is one thing where if you just have a glass of wine with your meal, you shouldn't worry about that because it's actually going to reduce your stagnancy. <laughs> okay. We want to know if that's true. Is that true? Can we get Dr. Hurdle to test it for it's us? It's going to help you. You're not going to see it. Are they part of that clinical trial? Yes. Uh, first, I just want to say thanks uh, on behalf of everyone for, for coming. We really appreciate it. Um, secondly, I'm wondering, like, you know, we, we don't all have the luxury of living in big cities and places where there are doctors who are familiar with all the literature, etc. What would you recommend if, if people go to their local, you know, their eye doctor? Like, what are the two or three important things that, that they should say when, say, taking kids to get their eyes examined? I mean, I got one thing out of it, which is to. Um, you know, they're always putting me behind that, whatever you call it, the thing, or and, and it's horrible. Right. And uh, mm -hmm. it's just, you know, so I got one thing out of that, which is, you know, to find a doctor who would not, who, who could do it the old fashioned way, I guess. But what are the two or three things that people should say to doctors, you know, when they know they have this, what, what should they say? Look, do this, don't do that in the examination. Uh, I, you know what, it's really hard for me to answer that, because okay. you imagine, going to your doctor and say, look, I know more about this than you do, and I want you to do this, this, and this. All right. You know, so That's true. I, that, does, that usually doesn't set up a good relationship. Yeah. But, uh, that question was, what two or three things? But I do understand where you're coming from, and I think it's, and I understand the frustration involved when you do know more about your problem than the doctor you're seeing, and how to approach that. And I'm no better at you that, than figuring that out. I, I, just because I know nystagmus doesn't mean I, I know how to interact socially any better than you do. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what the right answer is. I, I'm, I don't know how to it, help you, and I don't want to give you the wrong advice. It just depends on your doctor. My doctor knows he doesn't know anything about nystagmus, but that's not what I go to him for. He fits my contacts, and he does well with it, despite my eye movement. So I think he kind of lets me guide him. 
Yeah. I think it's important also because to, to talk to other people and know who they're comfortable with. I pr I've talked to other people who were so uncomfortable with the ophthalmologist because the ophthalmologist forced them to look straight and they're like, oh, this guy wasn't very sensitive. I'm like, that has nothing to do with sensitive, it's just knowledge. And I grew up with nystagmus and my eye doctor knew a little bit, I guess, looking back on it, but he always tried to get me to turn my head straight. And I, my oh. son has nystagmus and it's like a world of difference because the ophthalmologist that I use for him, he doesn't even buy, he's just like, just look. And he says, I'm not gonna do one eye. No, he, he looks at it to, to observe, but he doesn't, he says his vision, just like you just said, which was comforting to me to hear that there is no vision in both, like for each eye. It's when you have nystagmus, you have one vision, you know, test or whatever the, I don't know. The vision as a person. Yeah. He not just, as an eye. He just has, he only will record with both eyes open and looking. No, it's important to record each eye because <laughs> You, you want to equalize it as much as possible, and you want to detect the amblyopia. But it, that's not how I would consider the person's vision right. as a person. And, that, and that's, you kind of just become comfortable with the ophthalmologist, just trying different, you know, I've never said anything to the ophthalmologist, but just knowing that you can tell when they're knowledgeable. Yeah. I don't know, it's difficult. Yes? Um, the nystagmus? Oh, okay, it doesn't matter. Hard contacts versus soft contacts, do you notice a difference? So the question is uh, what type of contact lens, hard versus soft? But it turns out we thought that theoretically that hard would be better, but it doesn't make a difference. Um, so my question is, um, does nystagmus cause more blind spots or none at all? Um, I, I, I want to make sure, the, the question is does nystagmus cause blind spots? So I, I, what do you mean by like, blind? Um, right. I know that there's a spot in the eye that if you like, um, like if you're holding up a whiteboard and you put a black dot and you hold the board at a certain spot, the black dot doesn't look like it's there anymore. It looks like it's just whiteboard. Would that be true in nystagmus too? No. Uh, yes. It, you, the normal physiological blind spot cre is created by the optic nerve entering the retina, but it's filled in by the cortex in a very peculiar psychophysical process. But that's, that's no different in the nystagmus patient. It's the same. So you can map out the blind spot and you'll see it on a visual field. It's normal in the nystagmus patient. Yes? Yeah, I dropped that you were talking about. Will that help um, in theory work with all different types of nystagmus or this specific? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know more than I know. And I, I don't know if acquired nystagmus will behave the same way to peripherally induced changes, whether it's surgery, drops, or anything. Because the brain mechanism for all types of nystagmus is slightly different. And I'm treating them all the same way peripherally. It turns out that, interestingly, many forms of acquired nystagmus will also get better with eye muscle surgery, working on the emphasis. I, I, don't, know, I don't know what it is about this system that does this. So if that's the case, then many types of nystagmus may get better from drops as well. The only way that I can answer these, I'm, I'm still kind of a, an evidence-based guy, so I don't know. And I don't prescribe these drops regularly until we do the trials, even though Lou wants me to prescribe them, he's convinced they work. I have to do the clinical trial, you know, I can't, uh, I can't kind of go out and say I'm gonna start prescribing the drops until I do the clinical trials. With like an ocular algorithm where it's a pigment thing though, is it a, would a drop, so I think that one of the misunderstandings is, I'm glad you brought that out, the question is about the pigment in ocular albums. The lack of pigment does not cause the disease. It doesn't cause it. It's associated with it. And here's the reason. So the, the genetic defects that cause albinism really are the result of the loss of, uh, think of them as uh, kind of subcontracted construction workers that make pigment. <laughs> All right, so these little people now, men and women, because they both belong to the same union, <laughs> are making pigment during development and after development. That's their job. Uh, it turns out that during development, they're not sleeping or taking a break because you don't need pigment in the womb. So what they do is they guide the visual system's development. They guide it. They act like traffic cops. They don't, they're not responsible for actually neuronal development, but they guide the optic nerves and to guide the pathways, especially in the chiasmal area. 
So the, the same enzyme systems, the same construction workers that make pigment are also doing multitasking, developing the visual systems. So the less pigment, the less construction workers, the less the visual system is working. So the lack of pigment doesn't cause the visual system problem. It's the same enzyme system that's doing two separate jobs. And the motor disease of nystagmus associated with albinism is the same as if they didn't have albinism. So it responds the same way. Except for some reason, more of them have the PAN component. I don't know why that is. It may be some chiasmally induced, maybe pituitary or hypothalamic or other brain thing. So it, it's not causally related, it's associated. Yes? Are you still recruiting for the eye drop trial? And yes. How, if any of us want to be evaluated, how do we go about you that? You can uh, give me a call so you can save the trip, but generally the inclusion criteria now is you can't have had any surgery, surgical treatment because we need virgin muscles. <laughs> Darn. And you have to be over 12 years of age. And pretty much otherwise, you know, healthy. Yes. Can you be on the West Coast? Yes. Yes. On the preference for contacts over glasses, uh, how do we deal with that with an infant or toddler? Yeah, that's tough. Uh, I, I think they need some optical treatment. I think it's, in infants, it's easy to get contact lenses in, believe it or not. It's the, the terrible, two to 15 year olds. <laughs> <laughs> the infants are easy. You know, you put, we fit infants with contact lenses all the time for medical reasons, cataracts, glaucoma, iridia. So the infants, if the fam it's up to the family. I say, as soon as you can get the child in contact, get them in contact. Are we talking about surgically implanted contact? No, 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 no. These are daily wear or extended wear. You guys take them in and put them out, you know. Bathing suit on, contacts off. You know, diaper on, contacts on. You know, it works like that. It's like the family thing. You get. The families get good at putting the lens in and out. You learn how to do it. And after surgery? Uh, in addition to surgery, yeah, I'll do it. Some families, you know, these are the options. I, I just say, uh, when families come and see me, I say to the child, here's the options for treatment for you, medical, optical, surgical. If there's a surgical and contact lens, and I think that they're both appropriate, then I usually would do the surgery first <coughs> and do the contacts after. Because some of the fitting parameters may change as a result of the procedure. I doubt what's going on. I hate to do this because everyone wants to hear Dr. Hurdle speak and answer questions. I'll stick around for a little bit. We appreciate that. Huh? Sure. It's well taken over appreciation. Oh, and just being here is appreciation. Thank you very much. John, thank you. We were certainly behind schedule, but it was well worth it. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Hurdle. Um, just some quick housekeeping notes. Uh, pick up your children for lunch. It is closed from 1230 to 125. Yeah, chakra opens up again at 125. The first breakout session was 945, which is 15 minutes ago. Um, so if we can uh, do a five minute break and get to the breakout sessions. Uh, we have Jim Conley doing music technology in the Harrison room. And Chuck Huss, low vision driving in the Wilson room. And uh, thank you very much. The room to the main lobby level. Uh, they're in this tower. So which one are you going to?